and I'm trying to tell you as honestly as I know how what happened and I think this is a message I want to get across but as a young a young boy and I mean the boy of uh, 12 or 13 certainly uh, that I encountered outside the home again uh, in uh, the local grocery store or the local uh, uh, drug store the softcore pornography what people call softcore uh, but as I think I, I explained to you last night Dr. Dobson in an anecdote uh, that as young boys do we explored the the back roads and sideways and byways of our neighborhood and oftentimes people would dump the garbage and whatever they were cleaning out of their house and from time to time we'd come across so, pornographic books of a harder nature than uh, more uh, graphic you might say more explicit nature than we would encounter let's say in your local grocery store and this also included such things as let's say detective magazines and uh, more hard those that involve violence then. yes yes yeah. and I, I and this is something I think I want to emphasize is the the, the, the most damaging uh, uh, kinds of pornography and my again I'm talking from personal experience uh, hard, real, personal experience. The most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and, and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces, as, as I know only too well, brings about behavior that is just, uh, mm. is just uh, too terrible to describe. Now walk me through that. What was going on in your mind at that time? Okay, before we go any further, I think I mean, it's important to me and, uh, and the people people believe what I'm saying to tell you that that I'm not blaming pornography and not saying that it caused me to go out and do certain things and I take full responsibility for whatever I've done and all the things that I've done that's not the question here the question and, and, and the issue is how this kind of literature contributed and helped mold and, and shape the kinds of violent behavior it fueled your fantasies fueled, didn't it? well in in the beginning, it fuels this kind of thought process. Then, it, at a certain time, it's instrumental in what I would say crystallizing it, making it, making it into something which is almost an, like a separate entity inside. And that in, at that point, you're at the verge, or I was at the verge of acting out on this on this kind of these kinds of thoughts. Now, I really want to understand that you had gone about as far as you could go in your own fantasy life mm -hmm. with printed material and you made or printed and video or film Photo, or film photos, magazines yeah. what happened yeah. and and then there was the urge to take that little step or big step over to a physical right. uh, event and it happens it, it happened in stages gradually it doesn't necessarily not to me at least happen overnight my experience with I say pornography generally but with pornography that deals on a violent level with the sexuality um, is that once you become addicted to it and I look at this as a kind of addiction uh, like other kinds of addiction of addiction you keep I would keep looking for more potent more explicit more it's graphic kinds of material like an addiction you keep craving something which is harder harder something which which gives you a greater uh, sense of, uh, of uh, excitement until you reach the point where the pornography only goes so far you reach that jumping off point where you begin to wonder if, if maybe actually doing it will give you that which is beyond just reading Theodore about Robert it or Bundy, at it. born Theodore Robert Cowell November 24th 1946 to January 24th 1989 known as Ted Bundy was an American serial killer Bundy murdered numerous young women across the United States between 1974 and 1978. He twice escaped from prison before his final apprehension in February 1978. After more than a decade of vigorous denials, he eventually confessed to 30 murders, although the actual total of victims remains unknown. Estimates range from 29 to over 100, the general estimate being 35. Typically, Bundy would bludgeon his victims, then strangle them to death. He also engaged in rape and necrophilia. Bundy was born at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont, to Eleanor Louise Cowell. While the identity of his father remains a mystery, Bundy's birth certificate lists a Lloyd Marshall, 
born in 1916, although Bundy's mother would later tell of being seduced by a war veteran named Jack Worthington. Bundy's family did not believe this story, however, and expressed suspicion about Louise's violent, abusive father, Samuel Cowell. To avoid social stigma, Bundy's maternal grandparents, Samuel and Eleanor Cowell, claimed him as their son, in taking their last name, he became Theodore Robert Cowell. He grew up believing that his mother was his older sister. Bundy biographers Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth wrote that he learned Louise was actually his mother while he was in high school. True crime writer and rule, who knew Bundy personally, states that it was around 1969, shortly following a traumatic breakup with his college girlfriend. For the first few years of his life, Bundy and his mother lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In 1950, Bundy and his mother, whom he still believed was his sister, moved to live with relatives in Tacoma, Washington. Here, Louise Cowell had her son's surname changed from Cowell to Nelson. In 1951, one year after their move, Louise Cowell met Johnny Culpepper Bundy at an adult singles night held at Tacoma's First Methodist Church. In May of that year, the couple were married, and soon after Johnny Bundy adopted Ted, legally changing his last name to Bundy. Johnny and Louise Bundy had more children, whom the young Bundy spent much of his time babysitting. Johnny Bundy tried to include his stepson in camping trips and other father-son activities, but the boy remained emotionally detached from his stepfather. Bundy was a good student at Woodrow Wilson High School in Tacoma and was active in a local Methodist church, serving as vice president of the Methodist Youth Fellowship. He was involved with a local troop of the Boy Scouts of America. Socially, Bundy remained shy and introverted throughout his high school and early college years. He would say later that he hit a wall in high school and that he was unable to understand social behavior, stunting his social development. He maintained a facade of social activity, but he had no natural sense of how to get along with other people, saying, I didn't know what made things tick. I didn't know what made people want to be friends. I didn't know what made people attractive to one another. I didn't know what underlay social interactions. Years later, while on Florida's death row, Bundy would describe a part of himself that, from a young age, was fascinated by images of sex and violence. In early prison interviews, Bundy called this part of himself the entity. While still in his teens, Bundy would look through libraries for detective magazines and books on crime, focusing on sources that described sexual violence and featured pictures of dead bodies and violent sexuality. Before he was even out of high school, Bundy was a compulsive thief, a shoplifter, and on his way to becoming an amateur criminal. To support his love of skiing, Bundy stole skis and equipment and forged ski lift tickets. He was arrested twice as a juvenile, although these records were later expunged. In 1965, Bundy graduated from Woodrow Wilson High. Awarded a scholarship by the University of Puget Sound, UPS, he began that fall, taking courses in psychology and oriental studies. After two semesters at UPS, he decided to transfer to Seattle's University of Washington, UW. While a university student, Bundy worked as a grocery bagger and shelf stocker at a Seattle Safeway store on Queen and Hill, as well as other odd jobs. As part of his course of studies in psychology, he would later work as a night shift volunteer at Seattle's Suicide Hotline, a suicide crisis center that served the greater Seattle metropolitan and suburban areas. There, he met and worked alongside former Seattle policewoman and fledgling crime writer and rule, who would later write a biography of Bundy and his crimes, The Stranger Beside Me. He began a relationship with fellow university student Stephanie Brooks, a pseudonym, whom he met while enrolled at UW in 1967. Following her 1968 graduation and return to her family home in California, she ended the relationship, fed up with what she described as Bundy's immaturity and lack of ambition. Rule states that, around this time, Bundy decided to pay a visit to his birthplace, Burlington, Vermont. There, according to Rule, he visited the local records clerk and finally uncovered the truth of his parentage. After his discovery, Bundy became a more focused and dominant person. 
1968, he managed the Seattle office of Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign and attended the 1968 Republican Convention in Miami, Florida as a Rockefeller supporter. He re-enrolled at UW, this time with a major in psychology. Bundy became an honors student and was well-liked by his professors. In 1969, he started dating Elizabeth Klopfer, a divorced secretary with a daughter, who fell deeply in love with him. They would continue dating for more than six years, until he went to prison for kidnapping in 1976. Bundy graduated in 1972 from UW with a degree in psychology. Soon afterward, he again went to work for the state Republican Party, which included a close relationship with Governor Daniel J. Evans. During the campaign, Bundy followed Evans' Democratic opponent around the state, tape recording his speeches and reporting back to Evans personally. A minor scandal later followed when the Democrats found out about Bundy, who had been posing as a college student. In the fall of 1973, Bundy enrolled in the law school at the University of Utah, but he did poorly. He began skipping classes, finally dropping out in the spring of 1974. While on a business trip to California in the summer of 1973, Bundy came back into his ex-girlfriend Stephanie Brooks' life with a new look and attitude, this time as a serious, dedicated professional who had been accepted to law school. Bundy continued to date Klopfer as well, and neither woman was aware the other existed. Bundy courted Brooks throughout the rest of the year, and she accepted his marriage proposal. Two weeks later, however, shortly after New Year's 1974, he unceremoniously dumped her, refusing to return her phone calls. A few weeks after this breakup, Bundy began a murderous rampage in Washington state. No one knows exactly where and when Bundy began killing. Many Bundy experts, including Rule and former King County Detective Robert D. Keppel, believe Bundy may have started killing as far back as his early teens. Anne Marie Burr, an eight-year-old girl from Tacoma, vanished from her home in 1961 when Bundy was 14 years old, though Bundy always denied killing her. The day before his execution, Bundy told his lawyer that he made his first attempt to kidnap a woman in 1969 and implied that he committed his first actual murder sometime in 1972. At one point in his death row confessions with Keppel, Bundy said he committed his first murder in 1972. In 1973, one of Bundy's Republican Party friends saw a pair of handcuffs in the back of Bundy's Volkswagen. He was for many years a suspect in the December 1973 murder of Kathy Devine in Washington state, but DNA analysis led to another man's arrest and conviction for that crime in 2002. Bundy's earliest known, identified murders were committed in 1974, when he was 27. Shortly after midnight on January 4, 1974, Bundy entered the basement bedroom of 18-year-old Joni Lenz, pseudonym, a dancer and student at UW. Bundy bludgeoned her with a metal rod from her bed frame while she slept and sexually assaulted her with a speculum. Lenz was found the next morning by her roommates in a coma and lying in a pool of her own blood. She survived the attack but suffered permanent brain damage. Bundy's next victim was Linda Ann Healy, another UW student, and his cousin's roommate. In the early morning hours of February 1, 1974, Bundy broke into Healy's room, knocked her unconscious, dressed her in jeans and a shirt, wrapped her in a bed sheet, and carried her away. Coeds began disappearing at a rate of roughly one a month. On March 12, 1974, in Olympia, Bundy kidnapped and murdered Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College. On April 17, 1974, Susan Rancourt disappeared from the campus of Central Washington State College, CWSC, in Ellensburg. Later, two different CWSC coets would recount meeting a man with his arm in a cast one that night, one three nights earlier who asked for their help to carry a load of books to his Volkswagen Beetle. Next was Kathy Parks, last seen on the campus of Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon, on May 6, 1974. Brenda Ball was never seen again after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burien on June 1, 1974. Bundy then murdered George Ann Hawkins, a student at UW and a member of Kappa Alpha Theta, an on-campus sorority. 
In the early morning hours of June 11, 1974, she walked through an alley from her boyfriend's dormitory residence to her sorority house. She was never seen again. Witnesses later reported seeing a man with a light cast struggling to carry a briefcase in the area that night. 34. One co-ed reported that the man had asked for her help in carrying the briefcase to his car, a beetle. Bundy's Washington killing spree culminated on July 14, 1974, with the daytime abduction of Janice Ott and Denise Naslin from Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaquah. That day, eight different people told the police about the handsome young man with his left arm in a sling who called himself Ted. Five of them were women whom Ted asked for help unloading a sailboat from his beetle. One of them went with Ted as far as his car, where there was no sailboat, before declining to accompany him any farther. Three more witnesses testified to seeing him approach out with the story about the sailboat and to seeing her walk away from the beach in his company. She was never seen alive again. Naslin disappeared without a trace four hours later. King County detectives now had a description both of the suspect and his car. Some witnesses told investigators that the Ted they encountered spoke with a clipped, British-like accent. Soon, flyers were up all over the Seattle area. After seeing the police sketch and description of the Lake Sammamish suspect in both of the local newspapers and on television news reports, Bundy's girlfriend, one of his psychology professors at UW, and former co-worker and rule all reported him as a possible suspect. The police, receiving up to 200 tips per day, did not pay any special attention to a tip about a clean-cut law student. The fragmented remains of Ott and Nasland were discovered on September 7, 1974, off Interstate 90 near Issaquah, one mile from the park. Found along with the women's remains was an extra femur bone and vertebrae, which Bundy would identify as that of George Ann Hawkins shortly before his execution. Between March 1 and March 3, 1975, the skulls and jawbones of Healy, Rancourt, Parks and Ball were found on Taylor Mountain just east of Issaquah. Years later, Bundy claimed that he had also dumped Donna Manson's body there, but no trace of her was ever found. Bundy smiles for the cameras and pleads not guilty during a press conference announcing his indictment on first-degree murder charges. That autumn, Bundy began attending the University of Utah Law School in Salt Lake City, where he resumed killing in October. Nancy Wilcox disappeared from Holiday, Utah, on October 2, 1974. Wilcox was last seen riding in a Volkswagen Beetle. On October 18, 1974, Bundy murdered Melissa Smith, the 17-year-old daughter of Midvale Police Chief Lewis Smith. Bundy raped, sodomized and strangled her. Her body was found nine days later. Next was Laura Am, also 17, who disappeared when she left a Halloween party in Lehigh, Utah, on October 31, 1974. Her naked, beaten and strangled corpse was found nearly a month later by hikers on Thanksgiving Day, on the banks of a river in American Fork Canyon. In Murray, Utah, on November 8, 1974, Carol Durange narrowly escaped with her life. Claiming to be Officer Roseland of the Murray Police Department, Bundy approached her at the Fashion Place Mall, told her someone had tried to break into her car, and asked her to accompany him to the police station. She got into his car but refused his instruction to buckle her seatbelt. They drove for a short period before Bundy suddenly pulled to the shoulder and attempted to slap a pair of handcuffs on her. In the struggle, he fastened both loops to the same wrist. Bundy whipped out his crowbar, but Durange caught it in the air just before it would have cracked her skull. She then got the door open and tumbled out onto the highway, thus escaping from her would-be killer. About an hour later, a strange man showed up at Viewmont High School in Bountiful, Utah, where the drama club was putting on a play. He approached the drama teacher and then a student, asking both to come out to the parking lot to identify a car. Both declined. The drama teacher saw him again shortly before the end of the play, this time breathing hard, with his hair mussed and his shirt untucked. Another student saw the man lurking in the rear of the auditorium. Debbie Kent, a 17-year-old Viewmont High student, left the play at intermission to go and pick up her brother, and was never seen again. Later, investigators found a small key in the parking lot outside Viewmont High. It unlocked the handcuffs taken off Carol Durange. In 1975, 
While still attending law school at the University of Utah, Bundy shifted his crimes to Colorado. On January 12, 1975, Karen Campbell disappeared from a Wildwood Inn at Snowmass, Colorado, where she had been vacationing with her fiancé and his children. She vanished somewhere in a span of 50 feet between the elevator doors and her room. Her body was found on February 17, 1975. Next, Vail ski instructor Julie Cunningham disappeared on March 15, 1975, and Denise Oliverson in Grand Junction on April 6, 1975. While in prison, Bundy confessed to Colorado investigators that he used crutches to approach Cunningham after asking her to help him carry some ski boots to his car. At the car, Bundy clubbed her with his crowbar and immobilized her with handcuffs, later strangling her in a crime highly similar to the Hawkins murder. Lynette Culver went missing in Pocatello, Idaho, on May 6, 1975, from the grounds of her junior high school. After his return to Utah, Susan Curtis vanished on June 28, 1975. Bundy confessed to the Curtis murder minutes before his execution. The bodies of Cunningham, Culver, Curtis and Oliverson have never been recovered. Meanwhile, back in Washington, investigators were attempting to prioritize their enormous list of suspects. They used computers to cross-check different likely lists of suspects, classmates of Linda Healy, owners of Volkswagens, etc., against each other, and then identify suspects who turned up on more than one list. Theodore Robert Bundy was one of 25 people who turned up on four separate lists, and his case file was second on the to-be-investigated pile when the call came from Utah of an arrest. Bundy was arrested on August 16, 1975, in Salt Lake City, for failure to stop for a police officer. A search of his car revealed a ski mask, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, an ice pick, and other items that were thought by the police to be burglary tools. Bundy remained calm during questioning, explaining that he needed the mask for skiing and had found the handcuffs in a dumpster. Utah Detective Jerry Thompson connected Bundy and his Volkswagen to the Durange kidnapping and the missing girls and searched his apartment. The search uncovered a brochure of Colorado ski resorts with a check mark by the Wildwood Inn where Karen Campbell had disappeared. After searching his apartment, the police brought Bundy in for a lineup before Durange and the bountiful witnesses. They identified him as Officer Roseland and as the man lurking about the night Debbie Kent disappeared. Following a week-long trial, Bundy was convicted of Durange's kidnapping on March 1, 1976, and was sentenced to 15 years in Utah State Prison. Colorado authorities were pursuing murder charges, however, and Bundy was extradited there to stand trial. On June 7, 1977, in preparation for a hearing in the Karen Campbell murder trial, Bundy was taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen. During a court recess, he was allowed to visit the courthouse's law library, where he jumped out of the building from a second-story window and escaped, but sprained his right ankle during the jump. In the minutes following his escape, Bundy at first ran and then strolled casually through the small town toward Aspen Mountain. He made it all the way to the top of Aspen Mountain without being detected, where he rested for two days in an abandoned hunting cabin. But afterwards, he lost his sense of direction and wandered around the mountain, missing two trails that led down off the mountain to his intended destination, the town of Crested Butte. At one point, he came face to face with a gun-toting citizen who was one of the searchers scouring Aspen Mountain for Ted Bundy, but talked his way out of danger. On June 13, 1977, Bundy stole a car he found on the mountain. He drove back into Aspen and could have gotten away, but two police deputies noticed a Cadillac with dimmed headlights weaving in and out of its lane and pulled Bundy over. They recognized him and took him back to jail. Bundy had been on the lam for six days. He was back in custody, but Bundy worked on a new escape plan. He was being held in the Glenwood Springs, Colorado, jail while he awaited trial. He had acquired a hacksaw blade and $500 in cash, he later claimed the blade came from another prison inmate. Over two weeks, he saw through the welts fixing a small metal plate in the ceiling and, after dieting down still further, was able to fit through the hole and access the crawl space above. An informant in the prison told guards that he had heard Bundy moving around the ceiling during the nights before his escape, but the matter was not investigated. 
when Bundy's Aspen trial judge ruled on December 23, 1977, that the Karen Campbell murder trial would start on January 9, 1978, and change the venue to Colorado Springs, Bundy realized that he had to make his escape before he was transferred out of the Glenwood Springs jail. On the night of December 30, 1977, Bundy dressed warmly in packed books and files under his blanket to make it look like he was sleeping. He wriggled through the hall and up into the crawl space. Bundy crawled over to a spot directly above the jailer's linen closet. The jailer and his wife were out for the evening, dropped down into the jailer's apartment, and walked out the door. Bundy was free, but he was on foot in the middle of a bitterly cold, snowy Colorado night. He stole a broken down in G, but it stalled out in the mountains. Bundy was stuck on the side of Interstate 70 in the middle of the night in a blizzard, but another driver gave him a ride into Vale. From there he caught a bus to Denver and boarded the TWA 8.55 a.m. flight to Chicago. The Glenwood Springs jail guards did not notice Bundy was gone until noon on December 31, 1977, 17 hours after his escape, by which time Bundy was already in Chicago.